Good morning and welcome once again to our worship time of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ today. Uh, in the way of announcements, let me find them here. Uh, of course, remember, continue to remember our Wednesday evening Bible study prayer time at 6.30 and encourage you to be part of that. Uh, Saturday, reminder for the men, Saturday morning is our men's breakfast and prayer time together at 8 o'clock here at the church. Uh, it's always been a good time of fellowship for the guys and I just encourage uh, more of you to, to be part of that. Uh, our annual uh, Grace Bible Church family, fellow, or th family Thanksgiving meal will be on Saturday, November the 13th at 5 o'clock here at the church. And you need to sign up for that. Please remember to sign up for that by Sunday the 7th, by next Sunday. Uh, if you uh, plan on attending, that's always been a great time of fellowship uh, in the past when we've uh, been able to do that. And then, uh, uh, well, there's two things. There's a new one in the bulletin for the ladies looking ahead for the Thursday evening, December the 2nd, Ladies Christmas Fellowship. The details are to follow. You need to uh, have any, if you'd like to host that in your home, uh, just make sure you talk to Mary Jo about that. And then just, uh, just a quick reminder to remember to uh, mark on your calendar Sunday evening, December the 19th at 6 o'clock with Christmas candlelight service. And then also... Uh, Abraham is collecting diapers for uh, uh, your loving choices, and there's a box in the back uh, between now and November 28th, uh, particularly sizes fours and four and fives uh, is what he uh, needs, particularly for a service project that he's doing through school. So just a reminder about that to, uh, uh, to bring in those diapers, and let's fill that box up super full so he can't carry it back out to the car when we're all done. Um, so, uh, just remind you about that as well. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, now as we come before you to worship, Lord, just prepare our hearts. Help us, Father, to uh, just forget about all the activities of the past week and even the, maybe the challenges and the discouragements that we've had. Uh, Lord, just help us that we now can concentrate upon the worship of yourself, that of the, the good and the mighty things and the blessings that you have so greatly bestowed upon us. Forgive us, Father, for our wrongdoing. Forgive us for our uh, complacency. Forgive us, Father, for our lack of boldness. Forgive us, Father, for the words that we should have spoken and maybe we didn't. And also, Father, forgive us for the things that we've thought that we shouldn't have thought. Lord, guide and direct us in our worship time now as we come before you to worship this day. For I just pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Romans chapter 1, verses 16, 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it... The righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. That was the verse that changed Martin Luther's life. Uh, today, obviously, we remember his Reformation Sunday, October the 31st, was in 1517 when Martin Luther uh, nailed his 95 theses to, to the church door which changed the life of the church forever, although that wasn't the intent of Luther at that time. Basically, the intent of what he, where he was coming from was the church was selling indulgences to build a big cathedral, and he was um, more than upset about all of that when the pope was very, very rich. And one of the questions that he even asked was, uh, to, uh, was pretty bold in this, was, you know, to the Pope, you have all this money and you're very, very rich. Why are, you, why are you taking people from the poor? Why are you taking money from the poor people to build this fantastic cathedral? And, of course, that kind of got him into trouble eventually. But Martin Luther eventually, and like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't the fact that he set out to change the life of the church. 
he was concerned about the indulgences or the money that was that these these things that was being sold, which supposedly the Pope, when the money was received, people would automatically uh, be saved through that if there was somebody that he would pray for. Martin Luther got looking at this particular verse, and the Roman Catholic Church basically was looking at this from the Latin standpoint, and they were seeing this as justification that God, through the sacraments of the church and, and, and elsewhere, made unrighteous people righteous. Martin Luther got studying this from the Greek New Testament, realizing that it was an altogether different word, and his interpretation or what came out of it was that it was to regard or to count as righteous. So it was showing that we are saved by a righteousness that is not our own, and that's just putting the whole thing in really, really short, a short sentence. There's a whole lot more to it than that. But I also need to remind you that really Martin Luther wasn't the first who uh, got himself in trouble for standing firm and being bold in the truth of the word of God. There was men before him, John Wycliffe, uh, William Tyndale was burned at the stake. John Huss was burned at the stake for staying firm in the truths of the word of God, which actually had taken place even before uh, Martin Luther had come along. So today we want to concentrate our songs, particularly on the Reformation. And I'd just like to give you a couple quotes from Martin Luther, and particularly before we sing. <clears throat> says, a person who does not regard music as a marvelous creation of God must be a clodhopper, indeed, or does not deserve to be called a human being. He should be permitted to hear nothing but the brain of donkeys, and he used a much stronger word than that, and the grunting of hogs. So he said, a person who does not regard music as a marvelous creation of God must be a clodhopper, indeed, and does not deserve to be called a human being should be permitted to hear nothing but the brain of donkeys and the grunting of hogs. One of the other things that he said that I think we really need to take to heart is he said, you are not only responsible for what you say, but you are also for what you do not say. And we'll read another one in a little bit. But first of all, let's stand together and sing two of Martin Luther's hymns and, of course, the one I think needs no introduction whatsoever, a mighty fortress is our God. Uh, after the third verse, there is actually a, a, an interlude with a key change into the fourth verse, and I really want everybody to really be singing out on all of this because this is a mighty, mighty, perfectly good hymn, and it's just not, we need to not just pay attention to the tune, it's something that we like, it's a song that we like, but we need to be concentrating upon the words of not only this hymn, but then the one that follows, out of the, depth of, out of the depths I cry to you, which is also written by Martin Luther. So let's sing together.
Thank you. you. May be seated. <clears throat> scripture reading is from Leviticus chapter 17. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the people of Israel, and say to them, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded. If any one of the house of Israel kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or kills it outside the camp and does not bring it into the entrance of the tent of meeting to offer it as a gift to the Lord in front of the tabernacle of the Lord, blood guilt shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people." This is to the end that the people of Israel may bring their sacrifices, that they may sacrifice in the open field, that they may bring them to the Lord, to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and sacrifice them as sacrifices of peace offerings to the Lord. And the priest shall throw the blood of the, on the altar of the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and burn the fat for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So they shall no more sacrifice their sacrifices to goat demons, after whom they whore. This shall be a statue forever for them throughout their generations. And you shall say to them, any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them, who offers a burnt offering or a sacrifice and does not bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting to offer to the Lord, that man shall be cut off from his people. If any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Therefore I have said to the people of Israel, no person among you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger who sojourns among you eat blood. Anyone also of the people of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn among them, who takes in hunting any beast or bird that may be eaten, shall pour out its blood and cover it with earth. For the life of every creature is in its blood. Its blood is its life. Therefore I have said to the people of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any creature, for the life of every creature is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off, and every person who eats what dies of itself or what is torn by beasts whether he is a native or a sojourner, shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be, un and be unclean until that evening. Then he shall be clean. But if he does not wash them or bathe his flesh, he shall bear his iniquity. Here ends the eating, reading of God's holy word. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we again give you thanks for, first of all, I want to thank you for men of old who have had the boldness and the fortitude to stand firm in the truths of the word of God and have providentially, through your spirit working in them, have come to see the light of the gospel in its plain and simple truth. Men who were willing to be burned at the stake, men who were willing to, to die sacrificially for the sake of the gospel, Lord, we realize and we pray that there's so much of that that is missing in today's world, in today's life. We're even afraid sometimes to speak to our next door neighbor, to our relatives about the gospel of Christ and about the work of Christ and the justification through faith and the righteousness that is ours through his shed blood. And, and Lord, we, we, we should be ashamed of the fact that uh, of our failures and of our unwillingness to uh, to just live the life that is a godly life before you. Lord, I think so many times that we just, uh, we're just desirous and we're just happy, it seems like, to float along in life and think that, uh, that the salvation that we possess is just enough that, that uh, and we know, Father, that through faith that uh, that if you have that you have saved us and and it's not anything of ourselves but it's a gift of God 
through your grace, Father, manifested to us. And so, Father, we, we pray that you would help us to be bold in our, in our proclamation of the word of God. Help us, Father, to not only live a life, but, Father, help us to speak the word of God, to be willing to be ones who would also be desirous or be willing to sacrifice, be sacrificed for the sake of the gospel. Father, your son was so willing to do that and what he's done so much for us, and yet, Father, so many times we're not willing to do that for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of our relatives and for the sake of our neighbors and friends. Father, today we just think about some of the folks of our congregation. I think particularly of, of Todd, and Bard and, the, the, Todd and Barb and Reuben. And Lord, we know that they really wanted to be here. Um, they're doing well. I just talked with Todd last night, and I know they're doing well. And, and, uh, but yet at the same time, the, the, the protocols are for them to have to quarantine for a while. And, and so, Father, we just uh, pray that you can guide and direct them in their time there at home. And, and uh, uh, just bless them, Father, through the, through the word of God, through their own personal studies. And uh, we just give you thanks, Father, that uh, you have helped them to be safe and to be uh, not feeling any ill effects from, uh, from Reuben testing positive for COVID. Pray, Father, for just think about others of our congregation, if there's any that's right now feeling illnesses, and we thank you, Father, for uh, the quick recovery for Pastor and Brenda and the children there and what they've endured through the past week and a half or so, and we just thank you, Father, for the blessings upon the, that family and in, in helping them to recover as well. We think about, Father, our, our missionaries that are serving you in other places of the earth, and particularly uh, our missionary spotlight of, of Rawi and Nui Bunaparti in Thailand. And uh, they're still doing, Father, things mainstream or online. Um, and, of course, that's creating some, some uh, real problems for them. But uh, there is some great conveniences that's afforded them in this way. It's exhausting. But the big problem is they're not able to connect with the community in person and and there's just so much relevance to that, Father, of being able to connect uh, to people one-on-one. -on -one. We just thank you, Father, for the blessings that we have of being able to come together to minister today, to minister to one another, and to fellowship together with one another in a personal way. There's, there's, there's something that's very special about that, and also not only that, but you've, you've told us that from the scriptures that uh, we need to meet together. We need to be, we are a community, Father. We're a body of believers that uh, need one another so desperately, and we just give you thanks for that opportunity that we have to do that. So, Father, we just ask now that as we continue in our worship time that you would just be with Jeremy as he ministers the gospel to us, be with us as we continue to sing, um, and to sing with boldness, Father, the truths of the word of God. And I just pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> One other quote from Martin Luther that I found that I thought is so relevant 500 years later. I mean, everything is relevant, but 500 years later, this is so relevant. He said this, I'm afraid that the schools will prove the very gates of hell unless they diligently labor in explaining the Holy Scriptures and engraving them in the hearts of youth. Boy, how profound is that statement that was made 500 years ago when we think about what's going on in our world and in our life and in our schools today with all the things that's, that's transpiring. Um, what a prophetic word that was from Martin Luther. You saw on the front of your bulletin the five solas of scripture. The five solas of scripture, in a sense, really were not original with Martin Luther. They came years later. But there was the real thrust, thrust of, his, uh, of his message, uh, and that being scripture alone, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, to the glory of God alone. And those scriptures, I'm not going to spend the time to read them. 
scripture alone, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. You can make note of these if you so desire, and I'm sure that many of you are familiar with them already. 2 Timothy Peter, or 2 Peter 1, 21. We see faith and grace both in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for you're saved by by, uh, you're saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ alone, John 1, 1 through 5, and then verse 14 as well. And to the glory of God alone, uh, which is a, a really familiar passage of scripture to us, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. You know, all things that we do, do all to the glory and honor of God. And so we want to sing two more songs. Uh, again, both of these in reference to part of the, to part of the solas of scripture, First of all, in Christ alone, as we see that it's in Christ alone, it is our salvation. And then in relationship to the scriptures alone, a word of God incarnate, which is found in the Trinity, uh, number 267. So let's stand together as we sing these two songs.
Thank you. you. May be seated. this morning to the book of first john back in the book of first john this morning yes it is <laughs> okay we're in the book of first john this morning we're going to be looking at verses sixes and verses six and seven this morning but i'll start out here reading the whole chapter first john chapter one That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this morning as we're here, you know, celebrating the work you did over 500 years ago through Martin Luther and the 95 Theses and the way that you've continued to preserve your truth through, throughout the ages, throughout all time, Lord, this glorious, amazing truth. Lord, as we look at just a a small piece of that truth here this morning, Lord, open up up our hearts. Let us see just the, the wonder, the, the gloriousness that is here for us, Lord. Let us not miss this chance to gaze at your majesty. We praise you in your name. Amen. Okay, so in the year 1991, uh, Charlie Peacock released an album. It was, the album was titled Love Life. And one bookstore owner is quoted as saying regarding this album, we have decided to pull Charlie Peacock's new album off the shelves. It's filled with nothing but love songs. And as a Christian bookstore, we just can't justify carrying a record that's just about love. But if you actually gave this album a careful listen, and that's... uh, after peeling yourself off of your 1991 dance floor with your sweet 1991 dance moves, you saw that Charlie Peacock masterfully wove together this collection of songs that that had this back and forth between the realities of our relationship with God and our relationships with others. And placed right in between a song about a husband growing emotionally distant from his wife And another song where God is presented as love, showing that love was there in the beginning because God was there in the beginning. Uh, Sits possibly Charlie Peacock's biggest hit song. Uh, Became a hit a few years later for DC Talk, and like most things when they become popular, it lost its context and and had a critical part of the song cut out in that format. Uh, But Charlie Peacock sang... I keep trying to find a life on my own apart from you. I am the king of excuses. I've got one for every selfish thing I do. What's going on inside of me? I despise my own behavior. This only serves to confirm my suspicions that I'm still a man in need of a savior. 
The disease of self runs through my blood. It's a cancer fatal to the soul. Every attempt on my behalf has failed to bring the sickness under control. I want to be in the light as you are in the light. I want to shine like the stars in the heavens. O oh Lord, be my light and be my salvation. All I want is to be in the light of love. All I want is to be in the light. I want to be in the light as you are in the light. Let me into the presence of the Father. I will follow right behind. True love I will find. All I want is to be in the light of love. All I want is to be in the light. Is there such a thing as, in, as an inner peace? If there is, then a man of peace I want to be. I will need your help if I'm ever to be that. If I'm to lay down, lay down, lay down, then I'll lay my life for my brothers and sisters. I will need your help. Jesus, I need your light forever shining bright. So being in the light, walking in the light, that's where we're at in John's letter this morning. To recap, this is our third message in the book of 1 John. In our first message, we covered the first four verses. We saw John establish that Jesus, who was really God, also really was a man and walked on the earth. And John himself, along with the other apostles, saw and felt and actually experienced him with their senses. And John laid out his first purpose for writing this letter, so that our joy may be complete. Two weeks ago, we looked at verse 5. In that verse, we saw John lay out a foundational statement that is going to undergird what he says next. This is the message, uh, as we said then, this is the good news. We have heard from Christ and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is absolute righteousness an absolute truth, and there is no evil or deception in him, none at all. As we move on now, we're going to see three if we say statements, uh, each followed by a but if statement. If you remember the context of this letter, this is a pastoral letter written to a group of churches. These churches had seemingly been affected by Individuals who were teaching a false doctrine, a false Christology, who had separated from the fellowship as a result. These, if we say, statements appear to represent what those false teachers were presenting, whether through their words or their actions. And then the, the but-if statements are correctives John is giving these churches based on the message John had received from Christ while he walked with him. And all of this is undergirded by the truth that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So we're looking at the first of these if we say statements this morning. The first part of that, the, you know, the if we say statement is going to be verse 6 and the but if is going to be in verse 7. So in verse 6 it says, If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth. So John Piper said about this, I would conclude that walking in darkness means being controlled by desires for this world instead of desires for God. And he's grounding this in John 3.19, a verse we looked at in our last message. It was also in, in Kurt's uh, scripture reading last week. Uh, John 3, 19, the light, the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. And then Piper continues, when you walk in darkness, you are controlled by the desires for the soft, warm underbellies of prestige and power and two-second pleasures. This is the very opposite of what it means to have fellowship with God. It seems like those who went out from the fellowship were saying that they were saying they had fellowship with God, but their actions told a different story. How they lived 
directly contradicted their claim to walking with God. How they lived made them liars. John is saying that how we live matters. And if we say it doesn't, we lie. And of course, you know, at, at this point, there's, there's something inside of us that, that wants to get to 10 steps to live a better Christian life, eight ways to make our actions match our profession. We want to know what we can do to avoid this trap. What are the steps we can take to eliminate sin from our lives? But we can't go there. First of all, in his next if we say statements, John is going to say, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. There's no 12-step program to eliminate sin from our lives. But John is saying that how we live matters. If we say it doesn't, we lie. Uh, Justin Perdue, a pastor from North Carolina, asked the questions. If our hope is tethered to our faithfulness and performance, what happens to our hope when we are really struggling in our fight against sin and temptation? Where is our hope in the midst of trial when our faith is weak and our love is cold? There isn't any. John is saying that how we live matters. But when we look at ourselves in the mirror, when we examine our hearts and motives, we want to sing along with Charlie Peacock, don't we? What's going on inside of me? I despise my own behavior. The disease of self runs through my blood. The thought here should rightfully lead us to despair. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. But there sure still is darkness in us. Robert Murray McShane said, Learn much of your own heart, and when you have learned all you can, Remember, you have seen but a few yards into a pit that is unfathomable. Great, right? The darkness in in us isn't just bad. It's much worse than we can even see. So what's the difference between these liars who do not practice the truth and those who are saved, those who remain in the church? They're all sinners. We're all sinners. Filthy, wretched, rotten sinners. Every one of us. Uh, Dane Ortland's book, Deeper, I have have it here, Dane Ortland's book, Deeper. This has only been out for a few months now, but this book's been a friend to me as I've been reflecting on these issues this week. So Dane Ortland says in, in this book, Deeper, We come face to face with our sinfulness, not primarily by sitting and reflecting, looking within, pondering our hearts. We do need to do that. And in today's hyper fast paced world, too many of us never do stop and reflect on what is going on inside us. But self reflection only takes us so far. The blackness within comes into clear focus only when we see it next to the white brightness of God himself. We sense how desperate our plight is only when it is stacked up next to the infinite beauty of God himself. When an extraordinary catch of fish caused Peter to realize that the one in the boat with him was holy, divinity embodied, he did not clap Jesus on the back and thank him for a good good day's catch. He fell down on his face. Peter's words are arresting. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Luke 5.8 Have you experienced this? Do you know what it is to see yourself as vile and vulnerable in the presence of holiness himself? We will not grow, not deeply anyway except by going through the painful death 
of being honest about our own spiritual bankruptcy. We must see and feel our utter emptiness and innate rebellion and resistance in the presence of a God whose infinitude of beauty and perfection exposes such sinfulness. So that brings us to John's but here in verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. A few pages earlier from what we, we had just read, Ortland had said, what we do at conversion and what we continue to do 10,000 times thereafter is not ask God to give our otherwise ordered lives a little boost from heaven. What we do is collapse. We let the despair about who we are left to ourselves wash over us. In short, we die. And he goes on to say, as you descend down into death, into knowledge of the futility of what interchange you can achieve by your own efforts, it is there, right there, in that dismay and emptiness that God lives. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, walking in the light is the opposite of walking in darkness. It's our default setting. We naturally walk in darkness, right? Walking in darkness is our default setting. So how do we walk in the light? Importantly, John doesn't just say here, walk in the light. He says, walk in the light as he is in the light. And John gives us the critical detail. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In Leviticus 17, which Ron read this morning, uh, in verse 11 it said, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Atonement, of course, in the Old Testament was the idea of, of covering impurity and making right for sin. As God said, God said here in, in Leviticus 17 that he gave blood to do that covering and making right. The author of Hebrews said, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. John's telling us that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 1.7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Charles Spurgeon said about our promise in 1 John 1.7, the text being written in the present tense also indicates continuance. It was cleanseth yesterday. It is cleanseth today. It will be cleanseth tomorrow. It will always be so with you, Christian, until you cross the river. Every hour you may come to this fountain, for it cleanseth still. Notice likewise the completeness of the cleansing. The blood of Jesus cleanses the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Not only from sin, but from all sin. Reader, I cannot tell you the exceeding sweetness of this word, but I pray God, the Holy Ghost, to give you a taste of it. Manifold are our sins against God. Whether the bill be little or great, the same receipt can discharge one as the other. How do we walk in the light as he is in the light? 
Uh, we recognize, as, as we quoted from Ortland just a little bit ago, we recognize the futility of what interchange you can achieve by your own efforts. We let go. We die. And then we remind ourselves of that great work that Christ did on our behalf. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And we rest in that truth. We bask in the freedom that that truth gives us. Dane Ortland says, the Bible teaches that each experience of despair is to melt us afresh into deeper fellowship with Jesus. Like jumping on a trampoline, we are to go down into freshly felt emptiness, but then let that spring us high into fresh heights with Jesus. The Bible calls this two-step movement repentance and faith. Repentance is turning from self. Faith is turning to Jesus. You can't have one without the other. Repentance that does not turn to Jesus is not real repentance. Faith that has not first turned from self is not real faith. Both repentance and faith, however, must never be viewed in isolation from Jesus himself. They are connectors to Christ. They are not our contribution. They simply are the roads by which we get to real healing. Christ himself. Christ himself. That was the difference between those who went out and those who remained in the fellowship in 1 John. Some were united to Christ. Some just said they were. Some had their hearts of stone turned into hearts of flesh. And some showed by their actions that they didn't. Remember how John said that how we live matters? And if we say it doesn't, we lie? The Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs said this, From Christ as from a fountain, sanctification flows into the souls of the saints. Their sanctification comes not so much from their struggling and endeavors and vows and resolutions as it comes flowing to them from their union with him. Because the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin, we have atonement. We are made right with God. We are united to him and have status as his sons and daughters. Yes, we still sin. In fact, we are more acutely aware of our sin than ever. It's like Martin Luther said, we are simultaneous et peccator, or simultaneously saint and sinner. We are justified sinners. In the eyes of God, we are righteous because the blood of Jesus cleansed and continues to cleanse us from all sin. This is from a booklet entitled Faith Versus Faithfulness. Of course, we hate the idea that the Christian life is a long struggle against sin. But there is actually something rather comforting in the truth of this tension. It lies in the fact that the struggle is normal for the Christian who hasn't yet passed into glory. Often, when we struggle with sin, we start to doubt our own salvation. We start to wonder if it's really possible for a Christian to still be sinning after a certain number of years of knowing Christ. The idea of being simultaneously saint and sinner tells us that our situation is normal. There is no need to freak out and worry about the state of our salvation. And this is the truth that helps us to continue to battle sin. 
Because it is the truth that keeps us confessing our sins to God without fear. We don't have to worry about our standing before God. We know the Father has forgiven us in Christ. And we can confess our sins knowing he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We can keep going back to God with our sins because we know that in his eyes we are still righteous. We can be confident that he will not kick us out of the family. It is the Spirit that reveals to us our sin, causing us to admit that we have failed to keep God's law. The Spirit then pushes us to trust in Christ more, since he is our only hope of peace. And the Spirit continues to work at our desires at the heart level, causing us to trust more and more in Christ and less in ourselves. Simul justus et peccator is not a slogan to cause us to lower our standards. The standard of God's law doesn't change. It does, however, help us run to our Savior when we find ourselves sinning. It reminds us of the irrevocable gifts the Father has lavished on us because of the work of Christ. We will continue to sin, but he will continue to smile upon us. Truly nothing, not even ourselves, can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What do we have to do to walk in the light? Let go. Look to Christ and rest in his finished work on our behalf. It really is that simple. He did the work that we couldn't do and still can't do. His blood continually cleanses us if we are in him. But there's another part of verse 7 that, that we skipped. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Now, the way our two verses are set up, uh, with darkness and light being opposites, uh, it says if, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we would expect it to say, you know, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we actually have fellowship with him. But instead, it says, we have fellowship with one another. It gives our fellowship a horizontal dimension. This is why a song that cries, I want to be in the light as you are in the light, makes sense in the context of an album about love. You see, when we are walking in the light, we have nothing to hide from each other. When we are free in Christ, when we are resting in his finished work, truly resting, it transforms the relationships between us. We have no reason to hide our sin. It's cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We have no reason to worry about keeping up appearances. We are all sinners, all struggling through this broken world together. We're free to confess our sins to one another. Free. When a brother or sister is struggling with sin and confesses it, we don't chide him or look down on him or question his salvation. We remind him of his status. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And we exhort him to rest in that assurance as we walk alongside of him. That's real fellowship with one another. Freedom. Rest. And it flows directly from our fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Here's a story I read. I don't have a citation for this story when I Googled it to try to find a citation. It came up at multiple different sources, but, but it goes like this. One night in a church service, a young woman felt the tug of God at her heart. 
She responded to God's call and accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior. The young woman had a very rough past involving alcohol, drugs, and prostitution, but the change in her heart was evident. As time went on, she became a faithful member of the church. She eventually became involved in the ministry, teaching young children. It was not very long until this faithful young woman had caught the eye and heart of the pastor's son. The relationship grew and they began to make wedding plans. This is when the problems began. You see, about one half of the church did not think that a woman with a past such as hers was suitable for a pastor's son. The church began to argue and fight about the matter, so they decided to have a meeting. As the people made their arguments and tensions increased, the meeting was getting completely out of hand. The young woman became very upset about all the things being brought up about her past. As she began to cry, the pastor's son stood. He could not bear the pain it was causing his wife to be. He began to speak, and his statement was this. My fiancé's past is not what is on trial here. What you are questioning is the ability of the blood of Jesus to wash away sin. Today, you have put the blood of Jesus on trial. So, does it wash away sin or not? Does the blood of Jesus wash away sin or not? It does. As John tells us, all sin. And if we walk in that truth, practice that truth, rest in that truth, it transforms us. It transforms our fellowship one with another. As John said in verse 4, so that our joy may be complete. Is there such a thing as inner peace? If there is, then a man of peace I want to be. I will need your help if I'm ever to be that. If I'm to lay down, lay down, lay down, then I'll lay my life for my brothers and sisters. I will need your help. Jesus, I need your light forever shining bright. I want to be in the light as you are in the light. I want to shine like the stars in the heavens. O oh Lord, be my light and be my salvation. All I want is to be in the light of love. All I want is to be in the light. And at the culmination of this album that the Christian bookstore couldn't justify carrying because it was just about love, Charlie Peacock sings this. I've tasted the cup of mercy, mercy sweet. I've tasted the cup of grace, grace so sweet. And after all my days are done, perfect love I'll see when I stand with you, Lord, in glory. When I stand with you, Lord, I will not be alone. Together with the multitude, I'll stand before your throne. And when I stand with you, Lord, perfect will I be. When I stand with you, Lord, in glory. When we get there, that is when our joy will really be complete. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these amazing promises you've given us through your apostle, Lord, that your blood, which was shed for us, cleanses us from all sin. Lord, let us never doubt that truth. Let us never take that truth for granted. But as we go through each day, Lord, help us to rest in that truth and live our lives in the freedom that that truth gives us, the freedom to walk in the light as you are in the light. We praise you so much in your name. Amen.
Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, <clears throat> I think about uh, what Jeremy's just presented to us of walking in the light in relationship to where we're at today with Reformation Sunday and the five solas. It's only because of Christ alone, through faith alone, for the grace that he has uh, given to us through the scriptures that we can trust in God alone and that we can give the glory to him for it all. Let's finish up by singing a Reformation hymn. Uh, this is a fairly, this is a more modern, new hymn, but it encompasses all of the five solas of scripture, that we will trust in God's word alone, where his perfect will is known. We will live by faith alone, clothed in merit, not our own. We're saved by grace alone, undeserved yet freely shown. And we'll stand on Christ alone, the unyielding cornerstone, all to the glory and glory be to God the Father. Let's stand together. I'll have uh, Rachel play it through maybe one time.
And now the Lord, who has loved you with an everlasting love, support you all your days with the everlasting arms until the day when the Lord binds up the brokenness of his people and heals the wounds inflicted by his blow. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.